required to all take out our cough drops of Kleenex. We'll try and get through this. I uh, woke up on Friday morning afraid I was going to die, and I woke up Saturday morning afraid I wasn't going to die. So I think I'm on my on my way back. It's great to have the grandkids in, but uh, <laughs> tell some folks they brought the disease and pestilence with them. So. <laughs> um, Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Judges, chapter 6. The seventh book in the Bible. It's right around page 181. And we'll look at a few things in a moment. Just some uh, humorous things that <clears throat> I've uh, learned through the years from uh, Sunday school. Adam and Eve had an ideal marriage. He didn't have to hear, hear about all the men she could have married. And she didn't have to hear about the way his mother cooked. <laughs> uh, let me see here. Uh, Sunday school teacher asked the children just before she dismissed them to go to church. And why is it necessary to be quiet in church, she asked. And one of the little ones replied, because people are sleeping. <laughs> keep that happening from this morning and then finally Sunday school teacher was discussing the ten commandments with her five and six year olds after explaining the commandment to honor thy father and mother she asked is there a commandment that teaches us how to treat our brothers and sisters without missing a beat one little boy answered thou shall not kill <laughs> All right. we're going to be talking for a few weeks about Ordinary people that God was able to use in extraordinary ways. You know, we look at the disciples, and you know, they, they're the kind of guys that should be on stained glass windows um, and make statues out of them. But they were really ordinary folks, just like you and I. They were folks that got up every morning and just trying to figure out some days how they were going to get through the day, what they were going to do. So I submit to you that most of the heroes of the Bible are folks just like you and I, and we'll try and learn a few things together this morning. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer before we start. Lord, we just pray that you would uh, give me the the voice to get through this, but more importantly, that you would give me the words that you would want us to understand so that we can live better lives, more productive lives, more successful lives for you and your kingdom. In your name we ask these things. Amen. Gideon, the Lord is with you. And we're going to talk about Gideon now. Uh, he could also be called a guy that went from being a zero to being a hero. Gideon was a guy, he said he was of the least of all of the tribes, and he was the least, his father's house was the least in his tribe, and he was the least, he was the youngest in his father's house. So he was a guy, he was the bottom of the barrel, he was the bottom of the totem pole, he was the basement in the outhouse, if you please. He just didn't think very much of himself. But we're going to look at a few more, a, a few things uh, this morning. Just a quick background on Judges and the history of Israel at that time. Joshua had led the Israel uh, into the promised land. And one generation later, Israel is steeped in idolatry and not following God. They had left the ways of the Lord. Throughout the Old Testament scripture, you would see that there's a repeated uh, cycle, God's blessing, and then spiritual complacency, and then sin and idolatry, worshiping things other than God. Now, at that time, they had stone gods that they worshiped. They had a god of fertility that they worshiped. They had the god of rain. They had different gods that they worshiped. Today, in our day and age, we don't have the statues or, or gods of silver and gold that we, we worship. But some people do worship the almighty dollar. So that, in one way, is a god of silver and gold. 
There are people that put things before their service of God, and that's really all an idol is. An idol is something that takes your affection away from God. It could be another individual. It could be a situation. It could be a job. It could be your dollars. It could be a, a form of recreation. If it takes you away from God, beware that it does not become an idol in your life. So we see God's blessing, spiritual complacency, sin and idolatry, and then God's judgment coming and God's people suffering at the hands of enemies, a cry for help, and then God delivering. And so we see that pattern through the scripture. God raised up judges. Now we're going to see in a minute that a prophet came and spoke to them, spoke to the people of Israel before God went uh, to Gideon. Let's look at Judges chapter 6 verse 11 and we'll start reading there. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abrazite. By the way, that was supposed to be her name, but the uh, attendant didn't know how to spell it on her birth certificate. So that's how we got the Oprah we have this afternoon. But this was supposed to be her name. That was Mama's plan. Uh, verse 12, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Part, and verse 13 says, Pardon me, my Lord, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened? Now we have some, what appears to be, great sarcasm here in the scripture. I have been known at times, my wife tells me that I have a tendency sometimes to be sarcastic, and we'll let that go on without further comment, but I see great sarcasm here. Gideon is hiding in a well, thrashing out his grain. Now normally grain, you would go up you would be in an open area where the air, when you thrash the grain, the, the wind would carry the chaff away. He is down in a well. Here's what had been happening. The Midianites would wait until it was harvest time. Then they would sweep in uh, after the crops had been harvested. They would take the, the crops. They would take any animals that they would find. They would take them and then they would devastate anything they couldn't carry away, and then they would leave. They had done this every harvest time for seven years. That's why, Midian, that's why Gideon was hiding, thrashing out a little bit of grain so that he could make a little bit of bread so that he wouldn't die of starvation. <clears throat> and the agent says, uh, the angel said, the Lord is with you mighty warrior. The King James, if you're reading that, says, thou mighty man of valor. Gideon kind of pushes that aside and he says, pardon me, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? He is being sarcastic right back at the angel. Yeah, yeah. God had promised us he would take care of us, and he hasn't. Look at verse 14. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have, that's key, and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, verse 15, How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, Now, if I have now found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it's really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Verse 19, Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour he made bread without yeast, putting the meat in a basket, broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the yoke. The angel of the Lord God said to him, Take the meat, the unleavened bread, pay, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And get, Gideon did so. Verse 21, The angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff he had in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. 
When Gideon realized that it was an angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said unto him, Peace, be not afraid. You are not going to die. Verse 24, So Gideon built an altar to the Lord and called it, The, uh, the Lord is Peace. To this day it stands on Oprah of the Abrazites. That same night the Lord said to him, verse 25, take a, sec take a second bull from your father's herd, one that's seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal, cut down the Asherah pole beside it, then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of this height, using the wood of the pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as an offering. Now let's just stop here for a second. This, if we read through it too fast, you're going, to, you're going to miss the significance of this. The, uh, the angel of the Lord told Gideon, go to your father's house. Your father has an altar of Baal. Not only do I want you to tear down the altar of Baal, and then there's the pole that was there. That was another god, uh, god of agriculture for rain and, and sun and that type of thing. Tear that down, chop it up, build an altar out of it, and then take one of your dad's prize bulls and sacrifice it. One, the significance here is, is this. To have a bull. Remember the Midianites had been coming in and taking their animals away. A prize bull in this day and age is worth many, many thousands of dollars. At that age, after at that time, after the seven years of devastation for them to have an animal on the hoof was was very, very valuable. The other thing is that was like a farmer's tractor. The bull did most of the major heavy uh, lifting. And so it's like taking his father's tractor and destroying it. So he tore down, tore down his father's altar. He took the wood to this uh, foreign god, built an altar, and then took the bull and sacrificed it on. When, when the townspeople woke up the next morning there had been some devastation there had been a change in the town. It was a major big deal. Verse 27, so Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him but because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople he did it at night rather than in the daytime. In the morning when the people of the town got up there was Baal's altar demolished with the Asherah pole cut down beside it, the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. And they asked each other, who did this? And when they carefully investigated, they were told, Gideon, son of Joash, did it. So the people of the town demanded of Joash, bring out your son. He must die because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. But Joash re uh, replied to the crowd, the hostile crowd around him, are you going to plead Baal's case? Are you trying to save him? Uh, Baal was the god that they worshipped, the god of stone. Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal really is a god, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. So because Gideon broke down Baal's altar, they gave him the name uh, Jerob Baal, saying, Let Baal contend with him. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading. Uh, of, of his word. In chapter 7 and 8, we see that about uh, that Gideon, when he gathered up his army uh, of, of, of Israelites to go after the Midianites, because remember the angel of the Lord said, I'm going to send you after the Midianites. You're going to kill them all. And so Gideon proclaimed this after he made the statement and says, All right, God has led me to get the Midianites. Let's get everybody together and get ready to go fight him. He gathered about 32,000 people. Now they were grossly outnumbered because the number of the Midianites, the camp, was about 134,000. 32,000 against 135, 132,000. That's not very, very good odds. And God said, Gideon, you have too many people. And you remember <coughs> the story, how that they... Uh, he said, anyone that's afraid, go home. And 10,000 of them went home. And then he said, go down by the river and uh, tell everybody to get a drink. And those that cup the water and watch for the enemy, keep them. Those that just 
lap the water like a dog, send them home. And he was down to a very, very small number. But God gave them the victory. Now, what we're going to focus on this morning, and, and there's enough in these three or four chapters to probably go weeks, and I'm not going to do that because my voice is probably going to last about another 20 minutes. But there are three things that I want you to see this morning from the story of Gideon. First thing, we need to focus on what God says instead of focus on what God, what society says we are. If you look back at Judges uh, chapter th in the reading that we had, the angel of the Lord said to him, go with the strength you have. Now that's significant because that's significant because many times God asks us to do something and we say, Lord, I'm not strong enough. Lord, I don't have the strength to see this through. Lord, I don't have the resources to make this happen. But God says, go with the strength you have and I will multiply it. God calls Gideon a mighty warrior. In his society, Gideon was a nobody. He was an absolute zero. His family was the weakest. He is the least in his family. Gideon is saying, God, I can't be used. God, you've got it wrong. You must not know who I am. And I would, I would think that many times when we have maybe an opportunity to serve the Lord, we say, you know, no, 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 Lord, you got the wrong guy, not me. I can't handle that. You know, uh, Gideon, Gideon may have said something like uh, this to, uh, to God. You know that the servant of the poor family down the block, well, I'm just like the gum on the bottom of their shoe. I'm nothing. But guess what? God had a plan for Gideon. God knew who Gideon was. God knew what Gideon was capable of. We've said it before, I'll say it again. Jesus, when he looked at people, he always looked to potential. You are, you will be. You are, you will be. You are fishers, I will make you fishers of men. You are Simon, I will call you Peter. You will be a rock. Jesus always looked to potential. Again, those of us that have had the, have the honor of holding a newborn child, when you see that newborn child, what comes into your mind is potential. If it's, if it's your child, you, Lord, give me the strength to raise this child right, and this, ch this child can do great things. For the world that he's in or she is in. The Lord always looks to potential. Gideon was in a place where he could not do anything. But God was about to put him in a place where he could do everything. Gideon was afraid of having his food stolen. That, that was all he had left. But God was going to do a great and mighty work. He was afraid of the Midianites coming and killing him. And as it turned out, he was going to be the person that, uh, that defeated the Midianites. So he's in a wine press. He's hiding. He's, he's trying to just scratch out a living. And maybe you find yourself in that situation now. Maybe it's emotional. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's physical. That, you, Lord... I, I don't know if I've got the strength to go on another day. Lord, this is a terrible situation that I'm facing. Lord, I don't know how I'm going to do it. Well, the answer is, you're not going to do it in your strength. You're going to do it, if you do it at all, you're going to do it in His strength. You see, God, only not, God not only knows who you are and where you are, he knows that you need to focus on who he is and where he is. So if I am looking at my own strength and I am looking at my own situation, I'm going to be defeated. But if I look at God and I look at his abilities and I look at what he has done in the past and, and have faith of what he can do in the future, I can have victory. God can do all things and make you a useful 
person in his kingdom. He wants to do that because of who you are. He has made you for what you can do. You are a child of God. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, God has great things for you. You are valuable to God. In our own eyes, even in the eyes of society, sometimes we may think that we don't have a lot going for us. But again, if we have God on our side, we are only limited by God's power. The reality is God is not dependent on you and I to do anything. He doesn't need our money, but he wants a willing servant. He has chosen people like you and I to accomplish extraordinary things. He has chosen us as ordinary people to do extraordinary things for his honor and glory. The second thing we need to realize is God is faithful even when we have no faith. God is faithful when we are faithless. Gideon had a very weak faith. He was a defeatist. I mean, Gideon was a half glass, half empty kind of guy. He just didn't know how it was going to happen. But he was willing to listen to God. And in uh, Judges 6, 17, he says, Now if I've found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it's really you that's talking to me. And uh, at some other time, we'll go through the whole thing with the fleece there. Where, and for those that don't know the story, Gideon said, All right, Lord, just to make sure that I have all of this right, because this, this sounds pretty fantastic what you're talking about, I'm going to cut a fleece. I'm going to cut a square of cloth. And I'm going to lay it on the ground. And when I wake up in the morning, I want the ground to be uh, dry and the fleece to be wet. And when he woke up the next morning, the ground was dry and the fleece was wet. And he wrung the water out of him. He said, now, Lord, don't get mad at me, but I'm going to change it around on you tomorrow. Tomorrow, I want the, I want the uh, ground to be wet and the fleece to be dry. And it happened just that way. Now, I don't think that we should be taking out little squares of cloth and laying them on the lawn uh, at night to see what, uh, you know, the Lord's going to answer our prayer. But the point was, God had patience with Gideon because God knew that once Gideon had the faith that he would do what needed to be done. So you and I have faith in some things. We just don't have faith in everything. When we come up to a chair, we, we look at that chair and say, yeah, that chair will hold me. I will sit in that chair. I will have the faith to put my weight in that chair. When we walk into a room and we know that light switch is there, we flip that switch because we have the faith to know that, that those lights will come on. We do have faith in our lives. People say, I don't have any faith. No, you've got some faith. Now, you may need some more faith. You may need your faith uh, worked on. You may need to put your faith into turbo. But God can take the faith you have and make that faith stronger. Verse, uh, chapter uh, 6, verse 36, Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand as you promised, look, I'll place this wool, uh, wool fleece on the threshing floor. Uh, threshing floor. And, and we went through that story. That's where that is to look at that later. Gideon had faith that was small. But Gideon was able to grow his faith. God knows right where Gideon at, is at in his faith, and he knows where you are at in your faith, and God is patiently working to grow your faith. Some of the things that we go through, the telephone calls we get, the things we get in the mail, the things we hear about on the radio or TV, uh, the calls we get on the phone, the problems we go for, through on our life. Why is all this going on? Because God is trying to grow our faith. See, it was not so much that Gideon needed a sign to know what to do. God had told Gideon what to do. What he needed was more of an encouragement to do it. 
and through the fleece, God was able to encourage him. I am able to do these things. As we mature, we should not need as much of an encouragement from God to do the things that we know he wants us to do. The third and final thing, expect to be challenged privately before being used by God publicly. If we fail God in our private lives, why should he trust us with public things? We need to have those small successes in our private life. God wanted to grow Gideon's faith, but he does it by making use of the faith he had. He always starts in smaller ways that are close to home for us. For Gideon, he told him to tear down his father's altar and to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. That was a pretty big deal. That was a very big deal. But God starts to grow Gideon's faith in his own backyard before he expands to use them in a bigger way to defeat Israel's enemies. Maybe you desire to be used by God. I hope so. I hope that's the prayer of every heart here. That is a good desire. And the Lord has something for us all to do. Where's the Lord challenging you in your life? I think the Lord challenges us all. Is it a character issue? Maybe he's challenging you, challenging you in regard to your character. Maybe you have some private sin that you need to overcome. Maybe you have a problem with anger. Maybe you have a problem with procrastination. God is going to challenge you in your private life before he uses you in a larger, more public way. Service. Maybe uh, it's not an area of personal integrity, but maybe he's challenging you to serve in an additional way. There's an, a responsibility that you can take on. Some way you can serve the body of Christ. Maybe there's an area of service. Maybe God's calling you, in you, uh, you into a different area of, of ministry, either in the community or in the congregation. I will guarantee you that God is going to challenge you in a smaller step in the area of service before he challenges you, gives you an opportunity in a larger way. Are you serving with the gifts God has given you now? Maybe you could lead a small uh, uh, study, Bible study in your home. So, uh, you know, getting, getting up in front of people is not my thing. Okay, we'll gather some folks around and, and have a small Bible study in your home and uh, contact your deacon or, or uh, uh, one of the uh, leaders of the church to come in and help you and give you some things. Maybe you can just grab, gather some folks in your home. Is God leading you in that way? I don't know. Maybe uh, you could uh, be willing to either substitute in a Sunday school class or teach a Sunday school class. Uh, maybe God wants you to take an additional uh, responsibility in the church. All of leadership starts with service. And then finally, obedience. Maybe God, is, God needs you to obey in some area of your life. You know there are some things that God wants you to do, but you're holding that back from him. You're not moving forward in full obedience. Are you going to do what God says, or are you just going to do the things you feel like doing? There are some here that, that uh, there, are, there are things in your life that you know the Lord wants you to do, but you've been holding those things back. I, I trust that for 2015, you make it a purpose in your heart. Lord, I'm going to do what you want me to do. If we act in the obedience that comes from faith, we don't need to worry about the results. See, God never charged us to be that, that uh, with the results of what's going to happen. He is in charge of results. He only asks us to be obedient in what he asks us to do. Gideon's army was whittled down. And Gideon had no way of doing it in his strength. But when God, uh, God gave Gideon the task, and, and what, they, what they finally ended up doing was they had a trumpet, and they had a torch, and they had a, a, a pitcher, a clay pot. And they went up on the mountains and surrounded the Midianites. And then they gave out a shout. Uh, they gave out a shout, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, 
and they broke the, the pot, which made a noise all the way around the mountain. They held up the torch, and they blew the trumpet. Well, to the Midianites, one man with a trumpet and a torch represented uh, about uh, you know, thousands of men, and they thought they were surrounded, and they thought that they were going to die, and they uh, ended up in the confusion killing each other. Gideon did not have to kill one of the Midianites. They killed each other. But because he had done what the Lord had told him to do, the way he had told him to do it. Gideon was just an ordinary guy. Gideon was not a big shot. Gideon was the guy that you would always pass by. But I believe that God uses ordinary people. God uses regular people so that he can get the honor and the glory. It's because our God is extraordinary that he can use ordinary people like us. Are you willing? That's the big thing. Are you willing? If you are willing, then show that willingness by believing what God says that you can do. Do it by trusting God's faithfulness and allowing him to grow your faith. Do it by facing the smaller challenges in your life the way God wants you to do that. And then act in obedience when he gives you belief. Let's all stand together and let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord, we're thankful for the opportunity to look into your word. We're thankful for the opportunity to see what these great people of the faith had done. And Lord, how they were willing to be used, although they didn't understand how things were going to turn out. Lord, we pray that each and every one of us will examine our hearts and do what the Lord wants us to do this morning. In your name we ask these things. Amen. Let's remain standing. Stephanie, you come.